into your freedom our chains are gone and no weapon form shall prevail your word is stronger we overcome saints declaring your great renown your kingdom forever will stand we won't be shaken we will not fear our god a mighty warrior you're a consuming fire in victory you reign we triumph declaring your great renown your kingdom forever will stand we won't be shaken we will not fear our god a mighty warrior you're a consuming fire in victory you reign we try Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Element. We are so happy to have you here with us, whether you are in this room or if you are joining us on our live feed. We are just happy to be with you this morning. Um, and yeah, my name is Sarah McCool. For those of you who don't know me, hello. Uh, I serve on part of the staff team here at Element, and I get the job of welcoming you into service this morning, letting you know about some upcoming events and things that we have going on, um, and just letting you know a little bit more about who we are. 
Uh, if you are new or newer, whether you're in this room or on our live feed, we'd love a chance to connect with you and know that you are here. Uh, if you are watching on the live feed, you can fill out the digital connect card that is linked to this video. Uh, or if you're here in this room, just come on back to the Welcome Center after service. I would love to meet you personally. Uh, here at Element, we are a gospel-centered community who finds our identity in Jesus, and we hope that that is what you think of first and foremost whenever you hear the name Element. Okay, over the past few days, many of our gospel communities have been getting together in a tradition that we have called uh, agape, which means love. It is a meal that is shared within your community to reminisce on the past year, recognize all of the blessings that Jesus has given us, and just spend some time together. Um, I've been seeing some really cool different ways that people have been handling their agape. There was one in an arcade. I've seen Thanksgiving food, not Thanksgiving food. It's just a lot of fun and it's not too late to join one. So if you are not in a gospel community and you would still like to attend one of the agape meals, we actually have one happening here in the barn at 430 this evening. Um, so right across the dirt lot. We would love to have you and you have a chance to connect with our Brave Hearts GC as well as our youth ministry. So it's going to be a really nice night. Uh, we also wanted to give a reminder that Friday, December 3rd, we are hosting a ladies paint night. And uh, I've been told that they are trying to get me the picture so that you can see what artwork you will be recreating and it won't be a surprise. Mine won't look anything like it's supposed to. It'll be a surprise even if I see the picture ahead of time. So uh, the cost is $10. That includes all the supplies you need and all ladies junior high aged and up are invited. Lastly is a reminder of the upcoming Delta Holiday Store that takes place December 6th. Uh, some of us here on staff got a chance to meet with the Hope Club and have them get to see them starting to assess the layout and get ready for that. And we are just really excited to be offering this again this year. We did create a sign-up sheet for anybody who's interested in helping us sort items um, on December 5th, which is the last Sunday before the event, um, or if you want to help with setup on Monday, we're offering gift wrapping to the students on Tuesday. So if you wanted to help in any way, there is a sign up form. You can find it on version linked to that, or come on back to the Welcome Center and I can get it pulled up for you. Those are all the announcements I have. So now if you will please wave hello to the people around you while our band, nope, nope, there's another song. I blame her. <laughs> yeah. There was Okay. There's another song. Stand up. Shouted, I will sing forever for my king has come and he's coming again. I will stand and shout it, I will sing forever for my king has come and he's coming again. Set me free in a 
Is it a greeting now? Okay, I was not aware of this. Please say hi to some people around you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get the memo. Move your mic. How about this? I don't even have oh, is this on? I don't even have a funny little story to tell you before we start today. Nothing. Nothing. I know. Uh, Dave Yunt, you're totally sad and I can see that right now. Except you should go to the Agape thing if you haven't gone to one. You can go to one, the one here, 430 in the barn. They would love to have you. And then you will even let you uh, Yelp us. Make a Yelp review about how the food was. Okay, that seems to people like to make Yelp reviews about in churches. So <laughs> it's like, the coffee wasn't good. Okay. <laughs> so what? Was the gospel preached? I couldn't hear because uh, the coffee was so bad. I don't know. So. Oh, no, better yet, open table review us, like we're a restaurant or something. I don't know why I'm starting this way. If you're new to Element, welcome. Uh, there are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't own one, you can have one. If you forgot one, you can use one. There are sermon notes uh, across the room on the communion tables. They look like this. On the inside, you are going to get a paragraph that recaps what we talked about today. Underneath this, you're going to get five different things you can pray through during the week as well as a question to answer each day. And on the right-hand side, if you are not going to an agape, or you are, or you're just sitting with your family today or sometime this week, this is kind of a reflection to walk through and maybe ask these questions over the meal that you get to this week. Because it is, it's a crazy week uh, with Thanksgiving and all these things coming up. So if you want something to kind of reflect on about the goodness of who God is, kind of go through this. On the back side, you're going to get a, the psalm that we're covering today. And on the bottom, you get the verses that we go through. If you have a smart device, you can download an app. It is called Uversion. Click on more and then events in Uversion. We will come up by GPS in your smart device and you will get sermon notes, verses, questions, announcements, all that agape stuff, uh, everything you really need to kind of reflect on what we do today. Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's word. This is Psalm chapter 130, verses 1 and 2. And it says, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Let's pray. Father, today we ask that you would hear us as a people who know that we need mercy. God, that we wouldn't just cry for help. We'd be people who cry for mercy because of your grace and forgiveness that has been spoken over us. And in understanding that mercy, we'd be a people who also extend that mercy to others, that all of our lives be those that reflect the goodness of who you are that would worship you in the steps of discipleship that we take in all that we do. Amen. Have a seat. All right, so we are doing this series called the Psalms of the Songs of Ascent. Uh, that is Psalm 120 through 134. We're taking one week 
by week. This came out of the impetus for me from a book I read a couple decades ago. Yes, I'm that old. It's called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Now, they re-released this book recently, right after Eugene Peterson died. That's the guy who wrote it. And I just want to address something really quick, because I've gotten a few questions over the last little bit about Eugene Peterson. At the end of his life, Eugene Peterson kind of went a little wonky in a couple interviews he had. And I don't know if that was his age. I think the last interview he gave, he was 82 years old. And his theology kind of jumped around a little bit. And people had a bunch of questions. And he backtracked that. Guys, when we go through this book, first off, I curate to you the things that I pull out of it. I don't agree with everything in the long obedience in the same direction. Uh, he is more Armenian, if you know what that means, than, than I am. And so I curate some of the quotes that I give you out of it. Also, uh, Eugene Peterson, when he did the message translation, a lot of people had a problem with that. They said, oh, look at this guy. He doesn't think any of their translations are good enough out there. He's making his own. The reason Peterson did that translation is he thought that people weren't able to understand, really, the first off, the Psalms of Ascent in their own language of the day. And so he started there with a love for people, for wanting them to read the scriptures again. Now, do I agree with how he translated everything in the message translation? Not at all. Not at all. But it is a noble task. Uh, Eric and Mike and I, those are the other elders, we were having breakfast one day when I was putting today's message together. And Eric, one of our elders, said this to me. He goes, I think history will remember him better than how some Christians treated him the last decade of his life. And I think that's true. I think that's true. Because, again, he, he did go a little bit wonky in certain things that he said. As we go through these Psalms of Ascent, I read you from his translation because I want you to hear his heart in that. But I also give you the English Standard Version, which is what we use at Element. And if you have questions about Bible translations and why we have different Bible translations, you should come to our Gospel class, which is now called the Weekender, do a whole session on it. Uh, but really, all the Bible translations we have, they're not translations of translations of translations. They're going back to the original original manuscripts. They have different flavors and flares, though. So the English Standard Version, what we normally use, that is a version that goes and tries to translate like word for word for word for word that's there. And so you get like the words that are there. But if you have a New International Version or even say the message, what they're trying to do is give you the thought behind that. And when you get to the Psalms, sometimes when you go word by word by word, it loses the nuance and the flow of what it is. Now, I appreciate word for word translations. It's why that's the Bible we will give you when you're here. It's what we normally quote out of. But I do also create those things that are, that are thought for thought so you'd have the ideas behind it. Because if you want to have some like slow jazz, you know, some, some Marvin Gaye, you know, some real, real, you know, you want, the, you want the thought for thought. You don't want the word for word because you want to be able to move in that smooth kind of way that, you know, the ESV doesn't do at times. But I think the ESV is probably the best translation we have today. So if you want to know more about the Bible, Come to our gospel class, our weekender. But having said all that, what Peterson tried to do really was a noble thing. And like Eric said, I think people remember him better at the end of his, uh, in a few decades than they did how they treat him at the end of his life. So anyway, uh, when Peterson did this translation and talked about these Psalms of Ascent, the idea was not just knowledge about God. It was a life lived with him day by day by day. That's what this goes towards. And that resulted in that book I talked about, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, which centers itself on discipleship, how to live real faith in real lives no matter where we are. Again, not head knowledge, but actually knowledge in response to God's goodness, so we live in a relationship with him. So this is week 11. We've been going through 10 weeks of this so far, centering on discipleship. I think I got the slides fixed this week, so we're going to see how good you guys do. Here's your test. I know you're going to do bad, but that's okay. Jesus loves you anyway. All right, so the first step in discipleship is repentance. Repentance is returning to God. It's returning to who he calls us to be. We come home. Repentance is not a scary word. Repentance is how God calls us to come back to himself, and it's beautiful. And out of that repentance comes what? Trust. Oh my, you guys are doing better than I thought. I didn't know if you could get it too, but this is great. So trust, right? We trust what God has said. We believe his truth over the lies of the culture, and we ourselves tell ourselves sometimes. We trust his provision over us in the person of Christ. Now, out of repentance and trust comes what? Worship. Oh, my goodness. I'm very excited. I know you can't tell, but this is amazing. Okay, so out of worship and trust, or out of repentance and trust comes worship, where we acknowledge and ascribe the worth that is due God's name. And so out of that worship comes 
Service, exactly, service, where we start to serve the world around us as God has first served us in saving us. Then out of service comes witness. Wow, if I had candy, I would throw it at you right now. (laughs) Our witness, yes, our witness in the world comes about how we serve, but sometimes in witnessing in the world, living for God, it gets really hard, and that leads into... Oh, someone must have written this down. You wrote this down, didn't you? I'm glad you did. Okay, anyway, okay. Yes, steadfast. And steadfast doesn't mean that we are always steadfast, that we never have any doubts, that we don't have anxieties or worries. It's that God is steadfast. And we step into all these hard things. And as we walk through those hard things, we see day by day how faithful God himself is. That is what we understand as steadfast. And out of steadfast comes what? Joy, because we realize that God has been so good to us. So the next step in that journey then is joy. Out of joy comes what? Our work. Less and less of you. Okay, I'm losing some of you. That's okay, okay. So out of joy comes work. How we work and live in the world it comes out of that joy that God has done. Out of work comes what? Blessing, yes, because God has blessed us to make us able to work. So the things we do in the world become a blessing, not just to us, but to those around us. And then out of that blessing comes perseverance. And that's what we talked about last week, right? Perseverance, all these steps get to the place we see all the things that God does and enables us to be a people who persevere. No matter that we go through, that we build our lives on the rock that is Christ and not the empty sand that is ourselves. Psalm 129 last week really centers itself right there. It's the foundation of that psalm. And what you see is when God's people in the scriptures and even our lives today, when they're harassed and helpless, God doesn't turn away and walk away. What God does is he comes and he hears the cry and he is attentive. And God shows up either in his person or in miracles or in other people. God always shows up. God is always there. <clears throat> God is good. Now today, people will sing songs like, God is on our side, or God's always there for us. When you read that in the scriptures, it almost has a different meaning than we think of it today. Because when we think of it today, we think, oh, whatever I think, God's on my side. God agrees with my politics. God agrees that nobody can drive in a roundabout. God agrees, you know, it, God agrees that cats are terrible and dogs are great. God agrees, you know, we, that's what we think. God's on my side. But how a Hebrew would have understood that is that God has come to my side. I have run away from him, and God has come to me to be on my side to bring me to himself. It's a totally different connotation. And that's how we must be be a people that live, that God has come to our side to rescue us because we could not rescue ourselves. And this is where the Bible gets to declaring us righteous as a people. That is a right relationship with God again because God extends relationship to us because God is faithful. That means we get to look at all that has happened in our lives, though there has been tragedy and pain and suffering and disappointment, and we can see how God works all that into the blessings that can actually come into our lives. And that blessing then does lead into that perseverance. So Peterson writes this, God sticks to his relationship. He establishes a personal relationship with us and stays with it. The central reality for Christians is the personal, unalterable, persevering commitment God makes to us. Perseverance is not the result of our determination. It is the result of God's faithfulness. We get to be a people who continue in faith and walk with God, not because of our tenacity and not because of our stamina, but because God is righteous and has come to our side to be with us and draw us to himself. He goes on and he says, Christian discipleship is a process of paying more and more attention to God's righteousness and less and less attention to our own. It's that we have meaning in our lives, not by probing our own motives and desires. It's by looking at what God has done. We believe that God has a will and God has purposes, and so we trust him in that. And so when we speak of faithfulness, it is always referring to God's faithfulness first to us as a people, which then goes back to our perseverance. We're not trying to chart the rise and fall of our enthusiasms. We are trying to work out the reality of walking with him in discipleship day by day, by day. Now, I say all this to get us to where we're going today. You're like, that's a long intro. I know. I got a problem with long intros. But I think this all goes to the place of our next step in discipleship journey, which is prayer, which is prayer. And when I say that, I don't mean we haven't been praying every step of the journey as we go. But this place in prayer is a place of honesty and openness before who God is, that we stand before him and completely open so he sees all that's going on in here. Now, in the book, Along Obedience in the Same Direction, Peterson centers Psalm 130 on the idea of hope. And I think hope is there, but we're going to deal with that in the last week, Psalm 134. Uh, But I think it really goes down to the idea of prayer because this whole thing centers in prayer. So open your Bibles to Psalm 130. That is page 333 if you have an element Bible. 
And today, I think that we have made prayer really, really bizarre. Uh, people get really worked up about it. If I asked you to stand up and pray right now, most of you would be like, I am never coming to this church again. I am out of here. Like we think we do it wrong. God's going to judge us or people are going to judge us. People may judge you, but you know, I don't think God does in that. Uh, prayer really, in the end, is simply our communication with God. But when we get this far into this road of discipleship, we realize it is complete and utter honesty before him. That's where that prayer goes. And think of the amazing ramifications of who God is, right, and what God does, that God, the distance between us and God is really infinite. And yet God doesn't see us as worms groveling on the ground. God calls us to be sons and daughters. He calls us to himself. We get to express everything going on inside of us, whether it is worry or fear, whatever it is, and God hears us. And today I'm going to try to make this a little more serious for you to get the ramifications of what this means. So here is uh, Peterson's translation of Psalm 130. It's eight verses, and it says this. Help, God. The bottom has fallen out of my life. Master, hear my cry for help. Listen hard. Open your ears. Listen to my cries for mercy. If you, God, kept records on wrongdoings, who would stand a chance? As it turns out, forgiveness is your habit, and that's why you're worshipped. I pray to God my life of prayer and wait for what he'll say and do. My life is on the line before God, my Lord, waiting and watching till morning, waiting and watching till morning. O oh, Israel, wait and watch for God. With God's arrival comes love. With God's arrival comes generosity generous redemption. No doubt about it, he'll redeem Israel, buy back Israel from captivity to sin. Now you can see how that does center in hope, but it all starts and centers in this guy's prayer. Now to me it's interesting that in a lot of Christian circles today, emotion is the last way that people want to cry out to God. But the Psalms, especially the Psalms of Ascent, they are so emotional. They're just so emotional when you read through it. In some religious circles, there's almost a fear of emotion. And believe me, I get it because I am emotionally stunted. If you come up and you're crying, I'm like, I need Sarah, I need Michael, I need Mike, I need someone to come and talk to you because you're crying and I don't know what to do with emotion. So I really do understand that. But for a lot of people, we think that the blessings we get from God is because we are so stoic and we don't question and we just walk through everything and don't worry about all this stuff. I was talking to a friend of mine whose husband died a couple weeks ago and as I'm talking to her and she's really in turmoil she goes she goes I just want to ask God why but I know I'm not supposed to question why and I said who told you that who told you that if you read through the book of Psalms two-thirds of Psalms are people going why God why 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 we went through the book of Habakkuk over six weeks, and the whole time Habakkuk's like, why, why? The whole time, people cry out to God, why? And that's okay. God just doesn't want our silence. It's almost like we are afraid to admit before God, who knows everything, who we really are. Like we, we don't want us to maybe even see our own hearts and how fragile our own hearts are. And we think our goodness before God is based on what we do. I'm good, I gotta get it all together, and that's how God listens to me. And that is why this prayer is so important for us. These are normal people going to Jerusalem, going through hardships, praying out these things in turmoil and emotion, and they are taking it to God himself. Today, some people in the church would be really happy, again, if we got rid of all emotion. But the secular world, they go the exact opposite direction today. Everything in the secular world is all about emotion. How I feel about this, how I feel about that. And once you found out what your feelings are, well, that's who you really are, because that's what your feelings say. And the Psalms, especially this Psalm of Ascent, tells us it is dangerous to just ignore our feelings, and it's dangerous just to let them out and go with whatever they tell us. Stuffing them and letting them blow are not how we're called to live. And what these Psalms do is they teach us that we are supposed to pray our feelings to talk to God about what we are going through each step of the way. That's why these steps of discipleship lead us to this place where we are open and honest before God. It doesn't mean you just pray about your feelings, but you actually take them before God and you start to pour them out in a reflective way so we process in the presence of God. This is why to get to this place with perseverance and repentance and trust and worship, and all, it takes us right here. There are realities, I think, that will only come to us when we are in the presence of God. And again, I think today does go with last week and ideas of perseverance and what all that means because what do you do when you feel like a failure? What do you do when you sin and keep doing the same thing over and over and you want to stop and you can't and you feel so unworthy? How do we persevere? Well, we persevere by walking in a relationship with God and trusting what he has said and working this out through prayer. 
Psalm 130 has eight verses in it, and you see the feelings of failure that this person is going through. But again, he goes to God in prayer about it. God pulls this writer out of the hole they are in, and this hole is actually a hole of guilt and shame. And it's how we get to walk in discipleship with God, how we understand that guilt and shame and take it before him. The ESV will say it like this. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, that means keep a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Who could stand? And these words have been written throughout the Psalms. Psalm 69, verses 1 and 2. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. These are waters that he has stepped in. God is so high above me. I mean, I can't, how do I get out of this? Psalm 40, verse 2. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. I couldn't do this myself. This is what God did for me. The psalm writers over and over are expressing how they feel before God. I feel like I'm in quicksand. I feel like I'm going down. I don't know what to do. There's nothing to grab onto. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like that? Yeah, and what do you do with it? How do you begin to walk through that when you feel like a situation is beyond you, when you actually come to the place of realizing how bad your sin actually is? Uh, I was reading this thing by Charles Spurgeon this week, and he talked about how when people really come and trust and understand and know Christ, they actually truly begin to see their sin. It's like their sins become so much greater to them than, than before they even trusted Christ because they realize the distance between how we live and who Christ is. And what do you do with that? you got to go to God with it. The psalm writer here is talking again about his guilt and shame. I feel like I'm in quicksand. What do I do in, in the midst of that? Now, if you stepped in quicksand, uh, and when, as a child of the late 70s, early 80s, this is a big fear for me, okay? Because every cartoon, every TV show, Every movie had quicksand in it. A quicksand is very rare in the world, actually, but it was everywhere. I felt like I was going to walk across the street to my friend's house, and I'd be in quicksand. But what do you do in quicksand? You cry, help, help. That's what you do in quicksand. Well, probably, I'd probably yell it louder than that. You don't cry out for mercy in quicksand. Oh, mercy, quicksand, what are you doing? No, you cry out for help because you want someone to save you. Get me out of it. The person is crying out for mercy because they're understanding their guilt and their shame before God. That's why it's their own unworthiness in this, their own despair. That's why he cries out for mercy. The failure that he sees is like the personal blame. Now, here's a question. In our culture today, is that even relevant to our culture anymore? And the answer is, well, not to our culture. They don't think it's relevant at all. In our culture, we try so hard to get rid of any type of guilt with the idea that you should never feel guilty about anything you do at all in your life. Our culture, we are now looking at people from the past who would deal with things like Psalm 130, and we feel sorry for them. Oh, look at those poor people who had to deal with their guilt. Oh, they're, they're so sad. In our postmodern reality of our world today, these aren't part of our sensibilities anymore. On talk shows, people say things they would never say 30 and 40 years ago. Uh, th they all act like, and I actually use the word act like in that. They all act like they don't have to feel ashamed for anything. But that is not true. How do I know that? Because almost every single one of those people end up in therapy. That's, that's how I know. They're denying what is so obvious to their hearts and their souls that we are sinful. So let me give you an example. Uh, years ago, there was this TV show called Hogan's Heroes. I don't know if you ever heard it, okay? Uh, Hogan's Heroes was about people in a Nazi prisoner of war camp. It was a comedy, by the way. <laughs> it's kind of, trust me, it was a comedy. Anyway, there's this guy in his name, it was Bob Crane. And Bob Crane was the star. After Hogan's Heroes, he goes on to do some other stuff. He becomes very popular for a little bit. And then in 1978, Bob Crane is found murdered in his apartment. And then all this stuff comes out about his sex addiction and how he was filming himself with prostitutes. And all that came out. It's a scandal. His kids got put in the middle of it. Kids should never be put in the middle of it. And it was this really horrible thing. Now, later interviews within the last decade now, his children are speaking about this again. And they have totally changed how they were talking about it way back then. This is what they say now. The thing that was so bad back in the 70s, people thought that that was still shameful which Bob Crane was doing. As a result, everybody, everybody made us feel the shame that our father did that sort of thing. Nowadays, nobody would be all that upset about such a thing. Do you see the difference? Total difference. And essentially what's now being pushed is saying things like Psalm 30 are obsolete. We don't need them anymore. Why would anybody ever have any guilt that we have to work through? Like our culture says, you decide what's right and wrong for you. 
Don't let anybody tell you or put a guilt trip on you of anything that you want to do. And more and more people are trying to live that way. And they tell other people these things, and they are never dealing with the stuff in their heart and their lives. And yet so many people end up in therapy because they cannot figure out what is wrong inside of them. This is the problem. More than ever, we need things like Psalm 130 as a way to navigate guilt before God. We need this. These these feelings of not outrunning your past and, and coming up short, all the time they center on our identity. And this identity goes to the ideas of guilt and shame. Uh, Dick Keyes will point out that the opposite in the Bible of guilt is innocence, but the opposite of shame is the word glory or worth or significance. In, in guilt, we deal with something specific. Oh, I broke a rule. I've done something I shouldn't have done. But guilt, many times, it will turn into shame when it's not dealt with. In shame, we're feeling bad for something we did. Or, and then shame, it turns into who we actually are as a person. So in guilt, you're concerned about the negative. I broke the rules, and I'm going to get caught. In shame, we're dealing, again, with I was called to be something, and I failed to be that thing that I was called to be. It's, it's kind of more general, but I think it's much more devastating. It's kind of like this. Imagine you tell a lie. And you get caught in that lie. It's like you've been, ever since you're a little kid, your parents say, you know, don't lie. You know the average American tells 10 to 15 lies a day and doesn't even realize it? That's how terrible we are. We're all a bunch of liars. So there you go. Um, but we feel, you can feel guilty because you broke a rule. Oh, no, I got caught telling a lie. But that easily turns into shame if you think about it. Well, why did I even have to lie? What was it? Oh, I was worried. I was scared. Oh, I'm a coward. That's why I told that lie. And so you have this guilt because you broke the rule. I'm not supposed to lie. Ever since you're a little kid, not supposed to lie. But then that starts to cover you in shame because it changes your identity. It is now you did that because you're a coward. Yeah, I'm a coward. I shouldn't be a coward. Oh, my goodness. Guilt and shame are not the same, but they often go hand in hand. Now, see if this makes sense. Modern people today, because they say our moral standards are up to us, it gets harder and harder for anybody to honestly deal with the guilt in their lives about any particular deed. We can justify anything we want to say, eat, smoke, drink. We do it all, and yet we still can't get rid of the sense of shame that we all carry. Franz Kafka in his diary said this, The problem modern people have now is that we feel like sinners, though independent of guilt. See, he doesn't say we feel guilty even though we don't believe in sin. He says we feel like sinners, though independent of guilt. Meaning we're trying to get rid of all of our guilt and yet we are still feeling like there's something going on inside of us. Tim Keller says, modern people have really screwed themselves because we have no way of knowing what we're at really doing anymore. But what surprise, when an art, uh, writer, Ernest Becker, says this, we are all born with a deep neurotic fear of insignificance. And this is not a Christian, does, doesn't even believe in God. And yet he says, one thing I know absolutely sure, everybody grows up with the feeling that we are insignificant. We deeply aspire to do something enduring. We aspire to heroism. What does that mean? That means we were made for glory. And yet we fall short. Romans 3.23, for we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet today we are not dealing with the issues of sin in our lives before God. We're trying to deny all that they are, and by denying them, we are not dealing with them. And this leads us to a place of shame because we don't know what we're even supposed to deal with. And this psalm is meant to help us to go to God in prayer with it in honesty, to say, yeah, I have messed up. Yeah, these are the things that I do struggle with. Glory is, again, that word for significance and worth. And I could run therapist after therapist up here, I think the good ones, and they would tell you that there are all these people who are unable to identify any particular thing that they feel guilty about, and yet they feel shame and unworthiness. And for a hundred years now, we've been doing everything to loosen our moral strictures to say you decide what's right and wrong for you. And most people do. Most people that I know do. Oh, no, this is okay. God doesn't care. or God agrees with me. God's on my side. Now, again, not understanding what that means. And yet they're still sinking. And this person in the psalm comes to the reality of that. And he says, out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. He says, I am going through this. What do I, I can only go to God with this. And that's why it's so relevant. What do we do about guilt and shame and how we feel deep inside? Uh, Years ago, Tim Keller said that in regard to guilt and shame, what we need is a standard and a redeemer. And it took me years to understand what that meant. And I think I do now. I'm going to explain it to you and help my process for you, so you don't have to take years to do it, but it comes out of Psalm 130, verses 7 and 8. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So what do we need? We need a standard. What's a standard? Standard is a record of sins. 
That's a record of sins. Psalm 130, if you, God, kept a record of wrongdoings, if you, God, kept a record of iniquities, a record of sin, O oh Lord, who would stand a chance? Who could stand before you? The psalm writer is not denying that there is a record, even though God is a forgiving God. He says, there is an objective moral standard which we can judge our guilt and shame by. And again, we do everything we can to get rid of our guilt, trying to say it doesn't exist, and yet we still have a sense of condemnation deep inside of us that we can't get rid of. Here's the reason why. There is a standard. There is a standard, and that standard has been woven into creation itself. That standard is there. Our hard decision is, are we going to resist it, or are we going to agree with it? But I will tell you, disagreeing with it doesn't make it less true. It doesn't make it less true. All guilt is not bad. Like, don't you think uh, Hitler could have dealt with some more guilt? Like, oh, I probably shouldn't be killing all these people. That's a bad thing. That history would have been better if Hitler had a little more guilt. But not all guilt is good. Right? Some of the nicest people I know, they only operate out of guilt. They're always walking around with this guilty feeling and every little thing bothers them. So if you can't resist every little bit of guilt and you can't then, on the other hand, just always agree with guilt, how do we decide what to do with what? You have to have an objective moral standard. And that standard doesn't come from us. It can't because we are all over the board. Unless we have some way of deciding what is true, we will never, ever deal with guilt. And so the first thing we need is a standard. And what is interesting is how nuanced the Hebrew language is when it says, if you, God, kept a record of sins. This is literally like if you watch sins. And the Hebrew says, it's the eyes of God that are the only eyes that matter. And so that means we must go to God with it in prayer, in honesty. We go to him. There are lots of things that bring guilt and shame in our lives. Maybe you grew up and your parents wanted you to be a doctor, that you cure cancer, change the world, make lots of money. But as you grew up, you decided, I want to be a professional go-kart driver. And I will do all the roundabouts as a go And you, and you, you eke out a living, not much, but I don't know if you can do that. I don't know. I'm just making it up. Uh, but but you know, you're know, you making this go-kart thing. But every time you visit your parents, you feel bad because your parents wanted you to do this thing. You didn't do that. So what do you do? You go to God with it. You process with God about it. God, is this a sin? What do I need to do in the midst of this? And you realize God will say, no, that's not a sin. So what do you do? You throw away the guilt from that because it's not a sin. What matters is what God sees. It's false guilt and shame. You drive down the road singing at the top of your lungs with your windows down. We got the beat. Or I got friends in low places or something. People see you as you do this, and you're like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh. process that with God. God, is it a sin to, you know I'm going to say yes. I'm not going to say yes. But God, is it a sin to do? No, no. Keep singing we got the beat all the way down the road, all the way that you want. Now, on the other hand, what if you committed adultery? Yeah, what if you committed adultery? You try to convince yourself it's okay. It's what our culture tells you. Don't feel guilty about it because it's just evolution. It's just biology. You weren't getting what you needed at home. Well, you got to process that also with God. God, what do your eyes see? What do you think about this? And in God's eyes, that's a sin. And so what do you do? You confess it. You don't resist it. And you let that godly sorrow and grief lead you to our first step in discipleship, which is repentance. That's what you do with it. You don't hide from it. You don't live in shame from it. You deal with it with God. We must believe that God has a will, and his will is the only will that matters. Not mine, not yours in the end. We don't worry about what we think or even what other people think. The Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. See, even if we say it doesn't matter what others think, it only matters what I think, that's still going to lead you to a hole of guilt and shame. Paul says, God's eyes matters. It is the Lord who judges me. And then when we realize what God's standard is, we might get a little fearful of that because his standard is perfection. It's so high above ours. We can't live up to it. So then what do we need? We need that standard, but then what do we need? We need a redeemer. We need a redeemer because we could not live that standard ourselves. Psalm 130, verse 8. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. 
Have you ever talked to somebody, or maybe this is even you, and there's something in your past that you're ashamed of and gone through, and, and people have talked to you, you've talked to others, and like, yeah, but, but Jesus loves you, he forgives you, he's, he's drawn you to himself, he, he wants you to walk with him every day of your life, he forgives you, and then people will say something like, the trouble is, I just can't forgive myself. They say things like that. So you tell them about God's love and how redemption is plentiful, and yet they still come to this place where it's like, I, I still just can't forgive myself. They may deteriorate less quickly, but it's still there. It's because they can't get beyond their own sense of failure. Why? It's that we are putting our hope everywhere, but in the one our hope should actually be in. And we've all done it. This is where the psalm writer is. He's like, I put my hope somewhere else, God, and I'm being honest with you with it. I am talking to you about this. I need to bow myself completely before you. See, hope is what we all base our future on. What is God doing in our lives? Will, will he come and redeem? Well, the answer is yes. When we can't forgive ourselves, it means we become our own redeemer. We have put ourselves in God's shoes, and we, not, we are not even good enough for ourselves. So what we need is a new redeemer, because your old redeemer stinks. Because your old redeemer is you, or maybe a child, you know, my whole world's my kid, or a spouse, or a boss, or a friend, or something. Your old redeemer is terrible. It can never save you. It has failed you, and it will always fail you. When we become our own gods, that's when we sit in a place and we say, oh, I just can't forgive myself. Because you'd feel fine if your God loved you, but you don't really love you, so your God doesn't love you, and you feel horrible. You're a bad God. You're a bad God. If you can't forgive yourself, you've placed yourself above the God of the universe because his standards are so much higher than yours, so much higher. But Jesus comes to stand in our place for us, to redeem us, to pay for that sin that separates us from God. When we say, God has forgiven me, but that's not enough for me, that's because if your real God forgave you, well, you'd be okay. Oh, I just can't forgive myself. If your real Redeemer redeemed you, well, then you'd feel redeemed. The problem is the real God is not your God. You are your God. The problem is that the biblical God is not your God. This, the problem is the biblical Redeemer is not your Redeemer. The biblical hope is not your hope. And that is why that prayer is so important, because it takes us back to who the real God is. Out of the depths, I cry to you, not to me, to you. Oh, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy, because I need mercy, and you are a merciful God. We must stop crying to ourselves to be fulfilled. We must cry to the Lord. How much longer will we be a people who just beat ourselves up and yet still fall short time and again? O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. Guys, we need to understand there is a redeemer. There is a standard, and it is so much higher than ours, but there is also a redeemer. This is why it says, For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all of his iniquities. This literally translates as he himself will redeem Israel. This psalm is written for Jesus came. And so by the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this person is saying God is going to do this thing. God is going to redeem us, and Christ comes. And what, is, and what does Jesus do? He himself redeems us. How does he redeem us? With his unfailing love, with his unfailing grace, with his hope, with his own life given for us. Jesus' eyes are the ones that see everything, every little thing that you try and hide, and yet he loves you and calls you to himself anyway. He does. We put our hope in him because that is the knowledge that will transform and change us. We take all that we are before him. We lay all of ourselves in honesty before who God himself is. We stop trying to run. We stop trying to hide. We stop trying to make ourselves think we're so much better than we are. We stop trying to be our own God. We stop trying to be our own redeemer. And we honestly, before God, cry out, God, I need mercy. I need mercy because I see the truth about who I am. And that makes prayer, understanding it, I think something that just broadens the horizon for every single one of us, that we don't have to hide who we really are before him. And when you are sitting in a pit of guilt that is leading to shame, take it to the real redeemer. Speak about it. Because God wants us to be a people who understand that we are called to be his children. We're not called to be defined by our sin. You're not a coward. You're not someone who, you know, keeps listening to that horrible country music. You're not someone that's, that's running. It's you are a child of God. That's your identity. 
And when we live in sin and guilt that turns into shame, it changes our identity. And we must come back to trust what God has said over us. The band's going to come up. As they do, I'm going to invite you to communion. And I get it. Communion, how we're doing it now with the cups the way that they are, it's weird. And, you know, the, the, the wafer, I, I still think it's a great idea to break it like Christ's body was broken for us and drink the grape juice. But I know, sometimes it doesn't taste the greatest. And the grape juice is not the greatest. And I get it. But what it is, it's a reminder to come back, kind of what Psalm 130 does, to lead us back to the place to understand what Christ did for us as our Redeemer, to draw us to himself. We break the cracker. We drink the grape juice as this reminder of what God has done. This is why we don't pass communion around the room. We want God to start doing a work in your heart and your life. And then you get up and like you take that communion as a reminder of what God did to rescue us, what it cost Jesus, his life for our death his righteousness for our sin, to bring us back to himself. He is our redeemer because we can never redeem ourselves. He is our hope because we can never hope in ourselves. He is the one who forgives because we can't even forgive ourselves. And that is proven out every single day. We must be a people who trust him with all that we are. Guys, that's why I'd invite you to take communion today. If you need prayer, grab Sarah at the Welcome Center. If there is something in your life that you feel like is defining you, that is that you just can't be honest before other people or God himself, we would love to be able to pray with you about that. She'll connect you with somebody. If uh, you would like to give, there's offering boxes next to every door. We do not pass a plate at Element. It's always a response to what God is doing in our hearts and our lives. That's, that's why we give, because our God has been so generous to us. And then, you know, kind of grab those sermon notes and, and maybe walk through some of those questions with other people, those daily things each day this week, and, and then with other people, talk through some of those things of what it means to really go to God in prayer. Not, just, not that we shouldn't just pray about everything else, but actually being honest enough to go before God after all these steps of discipleship that lead us to this place of utter honesty before him about who we are. Because I think when we do that, I think we can stop being a people who are trying to make ourselves seem so put together around everybody else. We can simply live who we are, no matter where we are. And I think that will speak more to the grace of who God is than almost anything else, as we as a people, as his hands and feet, live in this world, the representative of who he is, in honesty about our own failures and where our hope actually is. It is in him. He is the one who rescues and saves and draws to himself. So let's be a people who worship him as our great God who rescues. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I ask that you would teach us to be those who come in utter honesty before you. That all the things that we don't want to talk about or feel guilty about or have driven us into shame that we don't want to even look at. That we would trust you enough to lay that actually before you. All the things that we would never even lay before people around us that we'd be honest enough to reflect upon our own lives and see what is actually there and the hope and grace you were calling us into. I ask that you would help us to understand in the midst of that, your unfailing love for us, the love that had you come and lay down your life for us because that is the only way we would ever be saved. We thank you there is a standard that doesn't come from us, but we also thank you for redeeming us because we can never live to that standard. And you know that. And that's why you came to redeem us and fulfill all of that yourself. Teach us to be those who trust you in each of these discipleship steps that out of this we would repent and trust and that we would worship you for who you are. That would translate into how we serve and how we witness and how we live with you every day. And all those steps would lead us to a place where we understand the depth of your goodness for us so we would be completely open and vulnerable and honest before you. Teach us to be those who speak and sing of your unfailing love, your grace, but also your truth. And that you would lead us deeper into relationship with you every day as we walk this discipleship journey with you. We ask this in your son's good name. Amen. So I'm going to ask Mikey to, to close the blinds on the side just to give you a few moments just to sit and, and think about that for a few moments. What, what things do you not even want to be honest with God about? What things do you, 
you don't even want to be honest with yourself about, so you won't be honest with God about it. What's going on inside of you right now that you think if, if you dealt with it yourself, it would just send you into a pit of despair? And then actually begin to deal with that and lay it before God himself and say, God, what do you want me to do? Start processing all those things that you may feel shame for and let God tell you what's a sin and what's not. Not what the culture says, but what the scriptures teach and what God's spirit actually says to trust him for what the truth actually is. Take a couple moments and, and lay your life before him and then come and take communion and then sing a song with us that there is no one like our great and good God and that we'd be a people then who step out of these walls as those who are the most honest in the entire world about who we are and then also about who God is because he is good. You have my heart And I am yours forever You are my strength And God of grace and power And everything you hold in your hand Still you make time for me I can't understand So I praise you, God of earth and sky How beautiful is your unfailing love Unfailing love and you never change, God, you remain the Holy One in my unfailing love, unfailing love. You are my rock, the one I hold on to. You are my song and I sing for you and everything you hold in your hand still you make time for me I can't understand so I praise you God of earth and sky
our Father, Creator, you hold this world together. There's no one higher than you. Redeemer, Defender, our great and mighty Savior, there's no one higher than you. And you to forgive us by your power we've been set free and Lord we stand amazed in your presence astounded by your mercy and love our hands are lifted high and surrender your grace for us is always enough and there is no one higher than our god and there is no one greater than you let my life forever praise the glory of your name because there is no Majestic in wonder, your reign with love forever. There's no one higher than you. The beauty, your splendor, your glory knows no measure. There's no one higher than you. And you are always with gracious to forgive us by your power we've been set free and lord we stand amazed at your presence astounded by your mercy and love our hands are lifted high in surrender for us is always enough and there is no one higher than our God and there is no one greater than you let my life forever praise the glory of your name because there is no one higher
Your grace for us is always enough And there is no one higher than our God There is no one greater than you Let my life forever praise the glory of your name Cause there is no one higher than you God, there is no one higher than you. Say it with me. God, there is no one higher than you. We praise you for that. As we have the last several weeks, uh, we are taking a journey up this mountain. At the end of every service, we are doing a thing called liturgy, a form of public worship. And it is a corporate prayer declaring who God is and all that comes out of that. So today, I'm going to continue this little tradition that we're doing, uh, reading from Psalm 130. If you, O Lord, kept records of our wrongs, who could stand? Out of all the depths we cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear our voice. Be open to our cries of mercy. But with you there is forgiveness, and so we worship. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I have hope. My soul waits for the Lord, watching and waiting. Wait for the Lord, hope in him, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is generous redemption. And he will redeem us from all iniquities, and he will free us from our sins. Thank you, God, for being good enough to see us for who we really are. You see us through and through, and yet you do not reject us, you do not shame us but rather you rescue and redeem us. What an amazing God. You provide a way of restored relationship. You adopt us as your children, giving us a new identity so we can walk in your ways, being honest of who we are, of our nature, and though all the ways that we do not want to live the way that you would have us do, the right way of living. Help us to be more honest in front of you and each other. Help us to be more thankful for all the blessings you provide. Thank you for your goodness. Amen. Amen. As you go today, continue to spend time searching your heart and your lives, being honest with who you are and who God is. Celebrate Thanksgiving this week in a way that is honest and open. And that leads us, me, with one last thing, and that is if you are not planning on going to an agape dinner, I personally invite you to please come to mine. Ours, we're meeting with the youth in the barn at 4.30 today. I would love to have all of you, where we are going to actually discuss some of the questions in the notes uh, and just share a meal and thank God for who he is. Have a great day. All right, would you guys please stand with us for one more song? more than we deserve you are unfailing and we are more than conquerors savior in you our future is secure by your power we will not be shaken we will not be silent sin is powerless our god
done our sin he carried and by his wounds we've overcome and now we stand redeemed and we are more than conquerors savior in you our future is secure and by your power Have a great day, everybody. Jesus loves you.